Hi everyone, I'm Dana and welcome back to Inverter Always. So in today's video, we are getting very close to the end of our Daikin VRVS install series. I think this is episode 13 now, and we're going to be focused all on control. So at this point in the series, you guys have finished the install. You've ran the system through test operation, and the system is fully functional in the grand scheme of things. However, there are a few adjustments that can be made at the controller that give you that much more control. Uh, some settings you can tweak to make the system perform a little bit more comfortably for the end user, uh, preference settings, things that don't always jump out at you in the main menu. So today we're going to be talking about field settings. So you guys, if you have any questions, as always, put them in the comments below. I will read all your comments and do my best to respond to everything you guys ask. There are no bad questions. This is a this is a learning opportunity for all of us. I just wanted to share this information with you guys as part of this series. This is not a factory training. This is not a training by any means. This is just me sharing some information with you guys from the installation and operation manuals and from my experience, from conversations and discussions from past classes that I have done with contractors, but this is not a training. The whole goal here is just to supplement, be an additional resource for you guys when you're out in the field. You have a quick question maybe you can't get a hold of somebody you can refer to these videos to get some quick answers just the meat and potatoes none of the veggies none of the extra stuff just important things you need to consider and look out for when installing and firing off and programming these daikin vrvs systems so i hope you guys enjoy today's video if you do please click the like button below it really helps out my channel and if you guys haven't already please consider subscribing all right let's jump right in Now, if you guys have been following my channel for some time, you will know that I've already done an extensive series on all of Daikin's controls options. When it comes to Daikin VRV, you could have a whole number of thermostats installed. And so in this video, I'm not going to necessarily walk you through how to set up the field settings on each of the thermostats because I've already done that and I'll put a card in the corner throughout this video on each of the playlists for each of your thermostat options for Daikin VRVS so that you can refer to each of those videos to see how to do the field settings. In today's video, I'm just going to go over some of the more important field settings that you need to be setting and some of the field settings that you may consider setting depending on your application. So it isn't so much going to be a here's how you do it. It's going to be a here are the ones that you need to set. Here are the ones that you may want to set and why. So more of a discussion. The other videos, again, I will link each of those playlists up in the corner throughout this video. Those are going to walk you through more of a step by step on here's how you change a field setting. So you guys, uh, as we dive in, the first thing that I'm going to talk to you guys about is where you guys are sensing room temperature. Now, out of the box, most of your Daikin VRV indoor units will sense room temperature from a combination of locations, and I really don't like this. And I've talked about this in some of my past videos. If the room temperature is far away from set point, the unit will by default use the return air thermistor that's built into the indoor unit. And it's not until it gets really close to the set point, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, I'm not giving you exact numbers, I'm paraphrasing here, but as it gets closer to the set point, it will jump from the return air thermistor down to the thermostat. And this is very inconsistent. So what you need to do on every single job is either choose the return air thermistor or choose the thermostat thermistor. Pick one or the other is basically what I'm saying. Don't let it jump back and forth because your room temperature is going to heat and cool inconsistently. You don't want the room temperature to all of a sudden change three or four degrees in the blink of an eye. So what I recommend doing is I always choose the thermostat thermistor by default. And only when I'm having an issue with temperature control for a variety of reasons or a variety of potential reasons, will I then change it to the return? For example, if the thermostat gets 
physically installed right next to a big huge window where it's getting nothing but solar heat the sun shining on it nonstop, it's going to affect the value of that thermistor so now your unit's always going to think it's 90 or 100 degrees in the space when really it's maybe not regardless of what setting you're going to select here it's going to be mode 20 setting 2-02 if you want to use the return air only or mode 20 setting 2-03 if you're going to use the thermostat only and from here i'll let you guys decide whichever you need for your application because it will vary but you need to make sure that you set this one way or the other on pretty much every single project at least in my experience the next two things we're going to talk about are fan speed so your fan speed what your fan speed does in thermo off i should say What's cool about Daikin VRV is Daikin gives you the ability to set your fan speed when the unit satisfies the cooling demand, cooling thermo off, totally separate from what the fan speed does when you're in heat thermo off. You've satisfied the heat demand. And by default, typically what we'll do is we will leave these at the default values. The default values on most indoor models is for heat, the fan goes to what's called low, low. So it is an internally lower than low fan speed. So if your thermostat is set up for low fan speed, you picked that, it'll go to a lower fan speed, even lower than that, low, low. That's why we call it low, low. And the idea here is just trickle a little bit of air across the coil. When the unit satisfies in the heat mode on a VRVS heat pump, the EEV doesn't fully close. It allows just a little bit of hot gas to flow through that heat exchanger. And we're not gonna talk about why in this video, it's just that's what it does. And therefore, having that fan on low, low gives you just enough heat in most cases if you've sized the indoor unit appropriately to kind of keep the air pretty consistent. So that way you're not overheating, but you're also not dropping the room temperature really quickly either. In the cooling mode, it's set up to remain at the fan speed that it was already set for. So if you have it set for high on the on the thermostat, it will stay on high when it satisfies the cooling load. And the idea here is if it's hot outside, it's summertime, you want to physically feel the air blowing all the time, whether it's actively cooling or not. And therefore, the fan speed doesn't change when it satisfies the cooling call. Now, a lot of folks will say, hey, my unit never shuts off. It just constantly runs the fan. So in either heating or cooling, whichever is the issue for the end user, you can go in and you can turn the fan off when it satisfies the heat call, goes heat thermal off, you can shut the fan off, or you could do this for cooling, or you could do it for both. It's nice that you have that option to do it for each mode separately. If you want to change the fan speed in heat thermal off, then that's gonna be mode 22. It's gonna be setting 3-01 for low, low, 3-02 to keep the fan at whatever speed you selected on the thermostat or 3-03 to turn the fan off when the unit satisfies the heat load and goes heat thermo off. For cooling, it's going to be mode 22 setting 6. 6-01 is the same thing, low, low, but for cooling. 6-02 is usually the default. That's keep the fan at whatever the speed was when it was actively cooling. And 6-03 is to turn the fan off. The next most important thing that I would say needs to be said on most jobs is your thermo on off dead band. And what this means is how many degrees below the set point does it wait until it calls for heat? And how many degrees above the set point does it wait until it says, hey, no more heat, I'm satisfied. You really only have two options here. You have a two degree Fahrenheit or a one degree Fahrenheit. I do everything in Fahrenheit because I'm in Seattle and North America. You guys might be using Celsius, which is fine. You can convert that accordingly. Basically, it's a half a degree or a one degree Celsius dead band. So out of the box, each indoor unit is going to be different. And there's, at least from what I've seen, no real rhyme or reason as to which ones are two and which ones are one. Maybe it's what manufacturer's plant they're manufactured at. I don't really know the answer. Some of your indoors are two degrees and some of your indoors are one degree. And so what I typically do, again, in my market, you don't need to do this if you don't want to, but in my market, I tighten up the dead band to one degree on all my indoor units on every single job as a baseline for all of my programming for every single job I do. And then I only change it from there if I need to, if there's a problem. 
The reason I kind of have a template to go off of on all of my jobs is so that I know that all of my jobs are the same, they're all consistent, and if I have a problem, it's usually an isolated incident, and I can change that particular setting for that particular user accordingly, rather than randomly or arbitrarily changing the settings on every single job and then having a problem and not knowing, is it because of the settings? Is it because something else? I don't know. So I keep everything as consistent as possible. And that way, if I start to see a trend, I know, okay, well, maybe that setting, that one particular setting needs to be changed across the board moving forward or something like that. I'm just giving you an example. And so to set the thermal on off dead band, it's going to be mode 22 setting number two. 2-01 is actually your wider dead band, your 2 degree Fahrenheit dead band, or your 1 degree Celsius dead band. 2-02 is the tighter dead band, 1 degree Fahrenheit, or half a degree Celsius. And so it's kind of backwards thinking, but you always want to set 2-02 so you have that nice tight dead band. So when you set a 1 degree dead band, the, the basics of how it'll work, let's say you're in the heat mode, because we're in heat a lot in my market, 8 months out of the year. When your set point is 70, it will call for heat if the room gets to 69. It'll do its best because it's an inverter to get back to 70 without overshooting 70. But if for any reason it overshoots 70 by one degree at 71, it goes all stop. It says, hey, no more heat. I'm going to wind that expansion valve down as far as I possibly can, ramp that fan down as much as I possibly can. I don't want any more heat. So that's how the thermal on off dead band works. And the same thing applies for cooling, but it would obviously be one degree above the cooling set point before it turns on and then one degree below the cooling set point before it says, hey, no more cooling. Now, as far as the field settings go, those four settings, your room sensing location, thermo dead band, and then your two fan speeds are really kind of the four core settings that you're going to do on all your indoor units across the board on all the applications, regardless of style, most of the time. And this is generally speaking. The other settings are gonna be application specific or unit style specific. So the next one we're gonna talk about is T1, T2. If you look at the indoor unit terminal block where you're landing all your comm wires, one of the terminals says T1, T2, Thomas 1, Thomas 2, and underneath it, it says forced off. By default, this is a open set of contacts. And when that set of contacts is closed, it forces the unit off. And forced off is a really fun uh, troubleshooting exercise for guys in class because we specifically talk about this. And then what I'll do is I'll go close that contact in the class and then they'll have to figure out, well, what happened? Why is my unit not turning on? Well, fun fact, when you try to turn on the nav controller, it says that it's under centralized control. It's being forced off. So you can't physically turn it on. So it's kind of a hint like, hey, I'm forced off. I can't operate. Even when there's no central controller, guys always think, well, it's because there's a central controller locking out the butt the button and it's like no that's, that's not what it is so forced off is is a fun one to do in class but in the real world this happens all the time because people will wire their condensate pump or their float switch um, for like a wet switch the alarm contacts which are typically normally closed contacts they will land those on t1 t2 which closes t1 t2 which forces off the thermostat and then that always generates a call. So I wanted to make sure to include it in this video because I'm trying to help you guys out. So I'm not generating all those calls. Um, what guys will sometimes do, and this is not what you want to do, is they will then wire the normally open set of contacts to T1, T2, and they won't change any of the field settings. The problem is if that condensate pump alarms and then closes T1, T2, it does force the unit off, but it won't generate an error code. We want to generate an error code using a condensate pump, just for this example. So T1, T2 can be reprogrammed. That's where I'm trying to go with this. You have three options to program T1, T2, how you may need to for an application. So the first option is the default, which is forced off. It's an open set of contacts, and when it closes, the unit is forced off, but there's no error codes. You can change this to option two. Option two is remote on off. And we use this for a few different reasons. Say you have a hotel, commercial application. I know we're talking VRVS, but the same thing applies for commercial. 
T1, T2. Option two is going to be remote on off. So if the contact opens, the unit shuts off. If the contact closes, the unit turns on. And so what we will do on hotel applications is have a key card. So when the person checks in, they get to their room, they put the key card in the little key card slot that closes a contact and turns on the HVAC unit for their room. So that is a neat feature. Then when they leave the room, they take the card out because they need the card to get back into the room and it shuts off the head in their room. So that way your thermostat's really just set point controlled versus on off control. The third option, oh, before we go to the third option, the other option for option two would be something like a makeup air unit in a kitchen. When we have a, a dedicated outside air indoor VRV unit that we can use the exhaust hood as a co closed contact as soon as we close the contact because the exhaust hood turns on, it turns on the makeup air 100% outside air indoor unit that's tied to the VRV heat pump. And then same thing when the exhaust fan shuts off, it opens up the contact on the indoor unit and now we're not just dumping outside air into the space. So cool applications for option two, but back to residential. Option three is what you're gonna need if you're going to tie in a condensate pump or a wet switch or a float switch of any kind to T1, T2. So mode 22, setting number one. 1-01 1 is the default forced off. 1-02 is going to be your remote on off and 1-03 is what you need to set it to if you have a condensate pump or a float switch of any kind that has a normally closed contact position. When you do this now, if the condensate pump fails and the float switch opens, because now T1, T2 is looking for the normally closed contact, if it opens, the unit shuts off and gives you an error code A0. There is something you need to look out for though here. If you use T1, T2 for a condensate pump and the condensate pump alarms, it will not only shut off and give you an A0 on that specific indoor unit, but it will shut down all of your indoor units and give you an A0. So this may or may not be something you want to utilize T1, T2 for. Any indoor unit that does not already have a built-in condensate lift pump has a float switch jumper you can use directly on the board. You simply cut the jumper, you, you, sh you sheath back the wires, you butt connector your float switch wires to it, and you don't have to program a thing. And then when it alarms, it only shuts down that unit, gives you an A3. Your condensate jumpers are typically either going to be uh, X8A or X15A on the indoor unit. And then units that already have the built-in lifts uh, will be utilizing that connector already. So in those cases, if you're using like a secondary uh, wet switch, then you have to use T1, T2 and it is what it is, but it's not the end of the world. Just be aware if you have T1, T2 utilized and it alarms, you will shut off the whole system. So FYI, for the most part, that is pretty much all I will set on most applications initially. And then if there is anything else I need to set, then I'm going to refer to the installation manual of that particular indoor unit to possibly change other field settings. For example, if I have an FXSQ, then I may need to change the static pressure settings on that unit. So at that point, I'll go ahead and I'll refer to the installation manual for that FXSQ and make those settings as necessary. But today's video, the goal was just to give you kind of that, that quick bulk list of here are the settings you need on every job, and here are the extra three or four that you may need on the majority of your projects. So you guys, any questions at all, put them in the comments below. I will read through your comments, answer them to the best of my ability. Remember, there are no bad questions. You guys were one big happy family. We are all trying to learn together here. You guys are my sponges. If you guys are thinking it, someone else is probably thinking it. So don't hesitate. Put your questions in the comments below, you guys. If you enjoyed today's video, please click the like button below. It really helps out my channel. And of course, if you guys haven't already, please consider subscribing. We are almost done with this series. I think I have one maybe two videos left, and then that's going to pretty much conclude uh, the Daikin VRVS install series where we go through the design discussion, we go through laying out the system, installing the equipment, firing it off, programming settings, and, and hopefully between all those little videos, you guys have everything you need to be dangerous, but always remember to read the installation instructions because this is not a training. This is really just giving guys that extra little reference material. So you guys, thank you so much for watching Inverter Always. I hope you all have an awesome day.